Yeah, for those for those who are online, we're going to get started in just a minute uh, as people are coming in from lunch here in, in person. Uh, but feel free to join this menti.com poll as well uh, using the code at the top. Oh, the different different auditoriums. Oh yeah, that's that's another one. Yeah, uh, I, why am I here? <laughs> I think I think if if your answer is I mixed up the auditoriums, that's the door in the back, <laughs> and there are the other auditoriums are not very far away. So, <laughs> all right, we're gonna go ahead and cool. It looks like we've got quite a few developers here in in the room. I thought that might be the case. Uh, we do have a separate developer session on Thursday, so today's gonna be a little bit less technical. We're not focusing on developer tools, but more on what types of things people do to extend and adapt DHS2 to their local use cases. Many of us build the things that help make that possible and others of us use those to adapt DHS2 to, to, to local use cases. Um, so yeah, it looks like we've got a few, uh, a, a little bit of a spectrum here of different people. For those just coming in, feel free to join this mentee. In just one minute, we'll uh, start with the first abstract presenter. And yeah, I will unshare my screen when that happens. Okay, yeah, it looks like we're evening, we're evening out here in terms of audience. Um, so that'll be interesting to have a discussion between this group. Um, oh, it's actually maybe frozen. Okay, now we're back. Um, I'm gonna unshare my screen, but we'll, we'll have more questions later. So feel free to please join this and it'll come up again later so you can join if you're, if you're not there already. Um, but without further ado, I'll turn it over to the first of our three abstract presenters today. Uh, Rick from Columbia University. And uh, I'll let him do a more more thorough introduction of himself and and uh, talk through the application that they've uh, built, uh, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. So write down your questions if you have them, and we can have a few minutes after the presentation. Thank you, Rick. Okay. Oh, is um. Is, but there'll be a prize for the first person who gets out of their seat without making a big noise. Yes. <laughs> Can you hear? Can you hear me back there? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for having me here today. I want to share an experience um, that we had at, at ICAP at Columbia University in New York. Um, and it was really a huge effort to move data from Google Sheets to DHS2. So hopefully uh, you can learn from the positives and the negatives of our experience. So I'm going to talk briefly today about what we had to move, some of the, the challenges that we faced. Um, bringing in all the historical data was a, a challenge in itself. And then talk about the different reporting approaches that we could have followed. Um, I'm going to talk about PDAC and then talk about the program indicators that we created, um, talk about the uh, getting going from tracker to aggregate data, and then um, some lessons learned. So this was our original, this was our task. We had a, a PEPFAR funded project that we inherited. And they started off collecting patient level data in Google Sheets. And it was just really all over the place. There, there wasn't uh, any centralized management. Uh, there were no SOPs. There was no automation to bring all this data together. Also, a, another goal was that 
we needed to capture some uh, critical data points such as as uh, age at uh, when various activities occurred. We also then had to migrate DHS to Tracker to aggregate program indicators. One of the challenges of this, I guess it's not a challenge for you if you speak Spanish, but if you don't speak Spanish, that's a challenge as well. Um, luckily, one of our lead developers did speak Spanish, so that helped a lot. Here's just a brief glimpse of what was in Google Sheets. We had over 20 forms and all varying in sizes. So there were about 200, over, over 200,000 items within these sheets. And this is just showing an example of the data entry form. So on the left, we have Google Sheets of how it looked when we inherited that. And then on the right is what we created in Tracker. And um, basically, the, one of the key differences here is in the Google Sheets that I'll talk about a little bit later, they, they were collecting org units um, a little differently. Um, so then one of the pluses of, of using Tracker was we could have a lot of real-time validation. Some of the obstacles that we faced, um, the, the historical data, we needed to bring all the data from Google Sheets over to DHIS2. Um, one of the problems was that data were collected across different regions and it, was con it, it, it wasn't uncommon for a client to jump from one region to another. So that presented more challenges, especially with the, the quality of the data. So we couldn't replicate it exactly going from Google Sheets to DHIS2. There were a lot of challenges, a lot of discussions on, on how to move forward uh, for various hurdles. Then as far as the reporting, we were challenged with enrollment-based program indicators versus event-based. And then also, as I mentioned, uh, the, another challenge was the language um, issue with Spanish. We did use the translation app in uh, DHS too. Has anyone else used that? Yes, okay, good. Um, and then as far as uh, the DHS two limitations, the, as far as the enrollment, you needed um, to aggregate those based on the, the owner of the org unit. And, but our reporting specifications required uh, that some of these needed to be on the event org unit. So that was more of a challenge. So a lot of this we hadn't really done before for this exact scenario and checking with the community, we didn't see a lot out there. So it, it, we really learned a lot from all this. So one task in itself was just going from the historical data import, getting that into DHS2. So we had a, a, first we started with a bunch of Excel files. We used Power Query to get those cleaned up. We, uh, one of our developers wrote a custom C-sharp application um, to apply the mappings and transform the data and then import that. Some of the lessons we learned from that, the first time we did it, we thought it was gonna be a one-time deal and it turned out that wasn't it. Um, there was kind of a parallel process. They were continuing to collect data in Google Sheets until everybody was trained and bought into the new DHIS2 approach. So um, this approach did have to happen numerous times. Um, another lesson learned was that there were there were data decisions we should have made before we imported, and they at the time it it didn't seem so obvious. And once we started to look at the data, and it's like, oh wow, we need to to take a step back here. And then also obviously being able to understand uh, how you're going to report on the data. So these are all the program indicators that we created, and I know the title of the abstract says fifteen thousand. I think it ended up being over 38,000 indicators. And this is how we came up with these. So just the first row for the, the event-based mirror indicators, there were 25. We had 16 age bands. We had 
three types of sex, um, no org units for that. But then if you multiply all those together, that equaled 4,800 indicators. So as you look through each row of this table, you'll see how we came up with these totals. Um, and when I meant say age band, I mean one to four, five to nine, and so on, up to 60 to 64, 65 plus. So those were all the various combinations. So for every single combination and org unit, in many cases, we created a separate program indicator. So that would be real tough to do manually and all by yourself. And I'll, I'll talk in a few minutes about the, the approach for that. But the, for the aggregation types, we had, as I mentioned, event, we had enrollment, where the event were coming just from a single form, the enrollment were coming from multiple forms. And there were various challenges or, or issues we had to address depending on, on each one. And as I mentioned earlier, it was not uncommon for an individual to get different services at different locations and even different org units. So all this um, was a bit of a challenge. So there were three approaches that we could take to reporting. Um, the event report app, the data visualizer app, or the one that we took, the third one of tracker data to aggregate data elements for program indicators to then using uh, the data visualizer to report. So I'm not gonna go over the approaches that we didn't use, but I'm, I'm just going to skip by those and you can reference those on the website to look at afterwards, or we can use those if there are any questions after. But basically our approach, we had um, custom scripts to create the, the region specific uh, program indicators. We used um, BAO's PDAC. Is there anyone here from BAO? Yes, oh, thank you. We love, we love PDAC. Uh, this really saved us because it did all this work magically for us. Um, and then we had a, a custom um, ex extract, transform, load uh, process to, to copy the data to the aggregate level. Um, some of the benefits uh, of this approach, we were able to mimic the reporting format that we needed. Uh, it was very user-friendly. Um, it just, it worked well. But some of the challenges, you know, as stated here, it was having to do some extra work to transform the data, create some scripts. Um, and then the org units, as I said, we kind of had to manually force this by having over 15,000 of those indicators. I'm not gonna go in this in much detail, but I just wanted to show you where you can reference this after the presentation. Um, we basically had the client level data uh, the formula processes, and then the aggregate data. And this is the flow of how the data went through from one step to another. And this is how we got uh, through the process using PDAC and creating over 15,000 indicators, getting to our final DHIS2 aggregate data set. I'm just going to show you a few uh, sneak peeks uh, screenshots of PDAC. Um, as I mentioned, it saved us a lot of time. For this one example, I have I have TX Cur, and I have all the various combinations you can see. Um, and it basically mapped all these for us. So you can see on the right here is that there's a scroll bar. If you were to scroll down, you would see all the possible combinations. And then that is how it process to generate the out the output um, aggregate data for us. And here's another screenshot of um, a non-mirror indicator. In this example, it's, it's syphilis. So we did the same thing where we had to have all these different combinations. And again, PDAC magically did all this mapping for us. So it was really, really helpful And this is an example showing uh, the the difference. The, the The top table here are the program indicators, and you 
if you can read those, uh, the columns of the, the tops of each column, you have every indicator and then every combination. And that just, if you can just imagine going left to right for a long, long time, but by putting it in that format, we were able to very easily use the data visualizer to give us the look that we need. So for priority populations, CREV, we have uh, can nicely show the data by, by age and gender and so on and, and time period. Here are um, two more examples that I will just pass by, but again, they're for your reference. The last thing I want to show is the the uh, process that we followed to uh, for the API to to process the data. Um, so you have our uh, at the top right we have uh, what P PDAC generated for each indicator, and then we have our API call, and this was all done through a Python script that our developer wrote. Uh, and basically it extracted these values um, from the API and did some transformations and then imported the data in. And this script would run every single night. So in conclusion, the next steps of our process, as I mentioned, there was some parallel work until everybody got trained and they're still not all trained, but they will be very soon. So very soon we're gonna cut off the Google Sheets and moving forward, they'll just enter all their data into DHS2 Tracker. And then we'll continue this process of creating uh, the program indicators automatically every night. As far as lessons learned, um, I think in hindsight, I would have done more, more research on figuring out how to clean the data, how it's gonna be reported at the finish line. And by knowing all that ahead of time, it probably would have saved us some steps at the beginning. Um, I think we made some effort at the very beginning to make a mirror image of the data collection forms. And it just, it didn't make sense for all the scenarios to do it that way. Um, so I think we tried too hard to do that. Um, it would have been helpful to get full consensus from everybody from the start. And um, there were a few steps where we actually went backwards having to rethink things. But um, it, it was a good experience. We learned a lot. I want to thank um, my coworkers at ICAP, Laura Lynx and Rafael Escobar and Becky Smith and Bill Reedy uh, and others all helped to develop this process and uh, and help put this presentation together. So um, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Questions or comments? Yes. That, yeah. for the people that are online. And okay. So the, the question is, uh, how, how easy was it to maintain or, or what were any challenges to maintaining the Python scripts for doing the ETL transforms and doing that on the back end with the server? Thank you. Right. That's a great question. Um, it, I think it, it, the, most of the effort went into developing the Python script to do the process. After that, it was very easy. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, we have it uh, set up on a server. It just runs automatically every single night. Um, so there still are a few manual steps involved. Um, so, but um, yes. Any other comments? 
Yes. Sure. Uh, the, the question was, would we be willing to share the Python script with the community? And um, that that's a great question. I think the answer is yes. Um, I maybe uh, I, can we attach it in the the COP uh, along with the link to it at least yeah link to yeah. it yeah okay so now we'll 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 be be glad to do that. One question you mentioned uh, needing to retrain a lot a lot of people to do data entry on DHS two rather than on Google Sheets. Yes. Uh, how many people are you, are we talking about, and and were, were some of the like, did it make things easier overall? Other than obviously training on a new system, but were there improvements to the the data collection flow, or were there challenges that you ran into with moving from Google Sheets, which maybe a lot of people know, to something like DHS two, which is a little bit more. Bespoke. Right. It was it was kind of a mix. It was probably more challenging that the DHS two was something new. Um, these for this particular project, these were all facilities in Colombia and South America, um, and they were they were all just so used to using the Google Sheets. And um, you know, for some people, they they don't they don't want to change. So you have that um, that you have to address. But um, the the training, um, yes, I, I think the biggest thing wasn't learning how to use DHS too. It, it was just getting people in the, the frame of mind that they have to do something different. Yes. Trained in total? Uh, 20, 20. 20 facilities. 20 facilities, yeah, great. You mentioned that you mentioned Realizing you're going to have to run the thing over and over again because it's going to be a one-off. Um, usually, the biggest problem with these things is keeping the metadata aligned over time. Did you have difficulties arising because maybe the age bands are being incorporated? Um, that that another excellent question. That if 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 you didn't hear it, it was um, asking about. Were, were there changes along the way, such as age bands? Um, like I can think of one, uh, like two years ago, um, I can't remember which one it was, but they they changed like, they added like 50 to 59 or something, you know? Um, and no, luckily we didn't have to deal with that. Um, but as far as the reason we had to do it more than once, I guess in our minds, we thought, we could just say, okay, starting tomorrow, we're gonna to go to DHS too. And it took a lot longer than that. And there wasn't buy-in from all the facilities yet. So, um, you know, getting the facilities and the Ministry of Health and all these people come to agreement took a long time. Um, Okay, here's a question online. How easy was it to maintain the program indicators mapping and skip script transformation, especially in use cases where there are frequent requests for changes? Um, I would say I don't think we really had to deal with that issue. Um, maybe we were lucky. Or maybe my developers dealt with it and I just don't know about it. <laughs> Which might be more likely the case. <laughs> There's a lot of developers in the audience, so you just won some brownie points, I think. Yes. Um, I think we're going to wrap up for, for the questions. Thank you very much, okay. Rick, for the presentation. And yeah. And our next presenter will actually be Alan Varkey from uh, uh, Indiana University online. Uh, so I think. I don't know if you're going, I think you're probably going to share your screen, Alan. Uh, yes, I am. Great. Thank you. Right. Okay, great. You're, we see you. So go ahead whenever you're ready. All right. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alan. Um, our 
work was basically uh, based on uh, collaborating open CPU with the HIS2 for an interactive application that helps in statistical analysis within the HIS2 itself. Uh, I'm one of the co-authors here. Uh, and so what OpenCPU is, it's basically an open source platform that enables you to use web APIs to um, process our codes on, on a server, and then you can actually do real-time data analysis and visualizations on those data points that you have already. So um, the capabilities that OpenCPU provides here are real-time execution of our code and scalability on server-side uh, data processing. So um, basically, you can implement it anywhere. Also, uh, you can use it as a, in Docker as well because it uh, enables in the uh, cont uh, container uh, object creations as well. And uh, yeah, so we wanted to implement these uh, capabilities of, of OpenCPU in DHIS2 itself to do statistical analysis. And this is the uh, project overview that we have here. Basically, uh, DHIS2 will have the database that we need for extracting the data through API calls, and then we would implement uh, OpenCPU, uh, run those codes on the application that we would develop, and then uh, we would uh, get an output in the set window uh, in form of either like statistical um, output or visualizations. So uh, basically the whole idea was to get in uh, the API calls to fetch the required data using the, the different filters that DHIS2 provides, like the organization unit, the data element, the data type, what uh, type of data in the sense of like what exactly are we trying to find and other filters that DHIS2 provides. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and directly use those API endpoints to gather that data set. And since all the data collection or uh, extraction is done in situ, we are also securing the data because uh, any sort of issues that might come later on will be mitigated with the DHIS2 uh, data security protocol itself. And we would use OpenCPU here for the statistical analysis. So this is a small demonstration that we have for our GUI. So uh, the whole idea was to have a filter uh, right here in which we would use, uh, like select the data set that we wanna uh, analyze. And then the R code editor would be there in which you can put in your own custom R code. And, and then just like uh, our studio, uh, you know, intuitive, uh, output, you would be able to see the results in uh, the same window side by side. So uh, the challenge we wanted to address here was to take away the laborious process of the traditional method that we have in, you know, creating a pivot tables, then downloading the CSV itself, then importing them to R or any sort of uh, editor that you want to use, and then do analysis and generate data. So instead, we would be using these API endpoints to get the data from DHIS2 itself, and then write the R code in the app itself, use OpenCPU to execute them, and then view the results um, in the application. Well, uh, so basically uh, our uh, application would provide a bridge between G, uh, DHIS2 and OpenCPU to do these uh, code runs and then provide them in a, a effective or basically efficient report generation or uh, analysis body. And the whole idea was to make it more user-friendly and we wanted to mimic how our studio uh, presents the data itself so that it's more intuitive for the users who have uh, 
used R Studio before. And since we're using APIs and everything is real time, uh, there won't be any delays or any sort of uh, data backlog happening. And since we're doing API calls, the transition between the data exploration and analysis is uh, seamless in this application. The overall uh, workflow simplification uh, compared to the traditional method was the aim here. And also, uh, since you're already getting the data uh, analyzed in situ, you are more efficient in assessing the situation and even have a ad hoc uh, analysis done on the data that you want. User autonomy, because you have the authority or it enables you to select data sets that you require, compose the R code yourself, and then see the uh, results in real time. Also, it extends the usability of DHIS2 itself because um, we are using all security protocols and uh, data uh, structure that DHIS2 follows. So uh, we are not like obstructing or like creating multiple steps in between as we go. So uh, in summary, uh, an application that integrates a DHS2 data retrieval with OpenCPU for a much better statistical analysis and data exploration experience with user autonomy. Uh, that is what we aim for here. And I would really like uh, your comments or your feedback in this project that we have right here. Thank you. Fun. There's, there's applause. I don't know if you can hear it, but there's applause in the room here. Uh, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, does anyone have questions for Alan about this open CPU integration? Sure. Yeah, um, I'm just going to pass off the mic. Sorry. Uh, and thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's a really great idea. I like the way the potential for it. I wonder if you could summarize any examples of a country or you know what what they have achieved, and then how it's fed fed back. Does the result end up going back into DHS two, or do you provide you know an output that's that's visible somewhere else? And then uh, second question is: uh, there's some other possible server arrangements, like our studio makes Plumber, which I think is somewhat. So I'm wondering if you explored other options and have any comment about which platform is best. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, the initial um, idea was to not feed it back to DHS to itself, because um, um, every time you run a code, uh, probably the thing or the analysis that you're looking for might not be uh, universal or uh, common knowledge. So what we were trying to do was like to have it uh, generate a separate report that can be downloaded uh, from the application itself so that uh, you can use it for your own safekeeping uh, later on. And uh, as far as uh, exploring other option goes, uh, right now the whole um, idea was to get this application running. Um, so we uh, still uh, have to look into other options as well. I mean, it was a really good uh, suggestion that you made here, but uh, yeah, we still have to look into that. Other questions for Alan? Um, which maybe some other people have as well. Um, is there any idea to, to share this, to let other people use it, to let other people maybe expand on it, those types of things? Where, where can they find it if it's already accessible? Um, yeah, can you expand on that? Yes, uh, it will be made available, but um, yes, uh, basically uh, we are working uh, in a lab in uh, Indiana University, Indianapolis. So uh, with the permission of the other co-authors, we will make the code available for open source, I mean, for public use. Um, right now it's a work in progress. So um, anyways, like I would like to commit it to uh, common use uh, as soon as we get a working prototype ready. And we would uh, pr provide a link to it uh, in the COP channel as well. 
Yeah, I know that there are many people who who use R with DHS too, and and I know that there's a lot of uh, friction to getting the data out, doing the doing the translation, making sure that you have the pipeline set up. So this can really improve that that uh, ability to iterate, and I'm sure there will be a lot of people interested in in using that, but also maybe contributing to it to to kind of build up the the ecosystem of people that are using R with DHS too. So really really great to see. Any oh, we have another question. Hold on. If you if you if it's a quick question, I'll repeat it. Otherwise, I'm coming to you. Thanks, Austin. Uh, every statistical analysis need data cleansing. So, uh, because if you import the data from specifically case based from the, but uh, I maybe missed something, but I don't see any data cleansing mechanism with this specific process? Yes, um, uh, thanks for that. Uh, basically, uh, you're getting the raw data from the DHIS2 itself. So data cleaning would be, or at least at this stage, would be done using the R code itself. Um, so as you said, uh, each uh, data that you retrieve is has its own use case. So according to your use case, you will have to uh, modify the data and you know have some sort of ETL process running uh, to match or at least satisfy your statistical requirement at that point. So um, that's why we instead of just providing uh, GUI dropdowns, uh, you know you can run the code to actually uh, clean the data and we are planning uh, planning to add more layers to the application later on so that um, we can, uh, have these options ready to go uh, if if the I mean to make the process easier so that you don't have to uh, write the same line of code again and again. Any other questions? All right, thank you again very much, Alan. All right, applause thank again. you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Applause, 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 applause. Just for the for the microphone for those that can't hear. It. Uh, thank you very much, Alan, for that presentation. And next thank up, you. we have uh, Nacho from ICT. And I think he will be joined by a colleague online as well. Yep. Thank you, Austin. Can you hear me? Yep. Is this one? This one? Yeah. Okay, so hello everybody. I'm Ignacio Foto or Nacho. If you want to call me like that, it's okay. Um, I'm director at the ICT and I'm here in the spirit. I have another colleague that is connected remotely. It's called Sneha Naranjanan. And that is, has been involved in all the development. And I have also, I know that they are watching me, all the amazing team of ICT. So I want to thank them for for this, this is obviously not my work, it's the team collaborative work. And the intention of this is also that it's your work because everything that you that we develop um, in ICT is open source. So we are really, we really believe on in open source, in open source. And we want you please to contribute and to help us in developing something that can be useful for the community. And yeah. So what I'm presenting here is the DHS to integrated logging library for advanced track, uh, data operation tracking. Sounds like super difficult, but it's nothing but a TypeScript library that is turning messages into program events. It's nothing but that. Super simple, super easy to use in the code. I uh, don't know if you will look at the very tiny text there, but we are trying to cover these two use cases mainly. Um, we discovered that while uh, doing many other operations, maintaining servers, DHIS2 servers, and many other operations, we were always repeating the same type of code. Sometimes you have a message, you need to print it into a log, and that log message, sometimes you need to be accessible for an end user. It's not only for sysadmin, but also an end user to be understanding what was happening. 
we were at that time uh, typing basically the generation of event on DHS2, so creating a program, sending events to that program, and that would be immediately uh, available for an end user of DHS2. So that was what we were doing. And suddenly we said, okay, can we just make it generic as we always do in <laughs> Nice City? And we did. So these two use cases are, uh, the first one is you are working with an app and uh, basically you are generating some messages. Where do you put them? The second one is uh, you have a backend service that is running on your server in a script, and then you want to extract those messages and put them somewhere available for an end user. And, um, and so in, in this operation, different type of messages can happen. You might be very familiar with these typical warning errors in for every type of level of messages. So how do you manage them to make them available? We are basically with this turning the HS2 into a monitoring tool, something that you can just open your capture up in the HS2 and you see all the log messages. And you can also uh, watch uh, cha uh, different charts, graphics that expose in the number of errors that you had in a certain operation, all things like that. Think on Crashlytics, think, so, think on uh, Google Analytics. Like the, the idea is a little bit to walk towards that direction being able to build applications that whose activity can be tracked in a DHS2, not necessarily the same DHS2 you are working in. Um, where it was born was, as I was saying, like repeated, repeating the same code is always something that we, did, we don't like. And um, at some point there was this antimicrobial department of, w, of WHO that were trying to track antimicrobial consumption data. And, the operation they were trying to do was so heavy that we recommended them to uh, create a, back, a background service and to run that background service on purpose when they wanted to uh, through a different through an, a, a, uh, an application or through a report. So basically, what the, the use case was: they were running an application. That application was requesting them to uh, they, they could request to to execute the very heavy calculations. And after a day, they were coming back and seeing the results of that those calculations. Um, how to do that in a way that those people that were really accessing the HS2 didn't need to go to a third system that was different from the two, the service and the DHS2. They had already credentials in DHS2, so why to take them out from DHS2? We um, we made something like this. This is the interface that they had. Um, so this is this is not the library. Okay, this is the interface. They were sending product level data for antimicrobial consumption. Then they were going to an interface that was just having different classifications. You don't need to retain that. Is something very particular to use case. Uh, but if you see that that button there, recalculate logic. Uh, that was launching that operation that at 3 a.m. will recalculate uh, all the historical data that they have according to a new classification of that data. So it was something that could take two, three, four hours to calculate. And then the day after, they were coming back and they had all this data available for them. And where? Well, in these, um, they, they could see how was the operation. They could see if there was any error in the operation of the, that historical data. So if they needed to launch the calculation again in a certain, uh, just reduced to a certain part of the organic tree or in a certain period. And um, so what, what has been the technological approach for implementing this? We always use, when we are working with the generic applications and you know that we love it, uh, because we have a lot, <laughs> and um, you need to think on the foundations of the of the software that you are creating. That's why a very long time ago we chose to follow clean architecture. That is a, one particular one, it's quite similar to an uh, onion architecture, hexagonal architecture. And the the things that we love from this architecture is that it's allowing us to separate the different layers of the software. And separating them means that we can test them isolately and you can implement um, uh, different vi variations of one of the layers without needing to rewrite everything in the, in, in the code. It needs some 
discipline. You need to be very strict on the pull request and when you are reviewing the code. But then if you follow it and everybody in your team is following it, um, it is easier to understand a code that doesn't that is not written by you and it's easier to be tested and to generate new use cases. So that has been the architecture for this also. And you can see like for the people that know about coding, how easy it is to use. So basically you import the, the library, then you just initialize the library. The library, you can see the typical things that you would expect from the initialization. So you can, you have to, to provide where you want to log the, the messages, you have to provide the credentials for that login. You have to provide also, um, well, obviously the credential that in case that you are logging outside or or something like that. If you are logging with the same user, you don't need to provide them. And uh, then you need to provide a program ID and the organization unit and, and the different type of messages. So the data elements that you, to, that you want to use. And then in your code, the only thing that you need to do is just to logger.debug. That will be generating an event to the selected organization unit, to the selected data elements, and just create an event there, which means that you are tracking, you are logging the activity that, of your application. And so simple as that. It's nothing but that. It's very simple, this, this library, but we think that it can be very useful. And I want to show you also some couple of examples. It, it started like what I was showing you before, this glass application, this antimicrobial consumption um, tracking. But then uh, we were contacted by the health workforce department at WHO with a completely different use case, but it was similar in, in, in certain aspects. And they wanted to, to do some data analysis, uh, actually some data quality. Uh, on the on the uh, uh, data that they had been collected all this time before. They were always repeating the same type of data quality review, um, outlier detection, some problem with disaggregation. So th it was quite clear for them what was needing to, to, to be detected, targeted. And because they were manually doing that into a DTS2, always creating visualizations and so on, they were asking us, cannot it be done automatically? So cannot you just identify those problems for us. And then we said, okay, we can extend the uh, capabilities of D2 Logger to be able to track um, this information, not only on an even program, but also on a tracker program. And that is what we did. So basically one tracked entity instance means and data quality analysis that you are performing. Each program stage is one of these analyses that you are doing, for example, outlier detection. And then when you have identified in the code of your application one a certain issue, you just write in the code D2 logger or logger dot uh, warning, logger dot error. And that is already generating the actual event in the program that you have configured initially, which means that you can get something like this. So you run the analytics, you run the, the analysis, and then for Peru 2022, there was one issue that has been detected. And so you can then later decide to treat that issue and to follow that um, during the time. I think uh, during one, uh, one of the plenary sessions, I heard somebody um, talking about this and actually, yeah. So with D2 Logger, you cannot do the uh, detection, but you can do the tracking at least. The detection, obviously, that was another application that we developed. And um, what are the limitations that we have at this stage? Uh, the D2 logger is an even program logger. Uh, so it's uh, limited to, and it's limited to only track a message and the type of message. That's the only thing that we're tracking at this stage. We want to obviously evolve, but that's what we have. And it is a synchronous operation. You know, at this moment, every time that we type that, um, that line in the code, at that moment, there will be an event generated. Obviously we want to bundle groups of messages in the future. We want to uh, be able to work offline and then send anything that has been generated offline, things like that. And I don't want to take more time. So yeah, just to tell you that this is there available for you. It's in, you can use it from NPM uh, if you used to develop in TypeScript. And thank you. Um, I will pass the now to, to Sneha, my colleague that is there and can share a screen and show you in real time with a playground how this work in, 
in a real environment. Sneha, are you around? Yeah, hi. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, perfectly. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. I, guess I hope I you can see my here. screen. Yep. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to show how easy it is to use D2 logger and how then you can have your logs in DHIS. So in your DHIS instance, what you if you want a simple logger, what you'll need is you have to create an event program, uh, register it to some organization unit, and it needs to have two data elements, a message and a message type. And as you can see here, there are no uh, events for this program. Now let's look at the code. In the code, all you have to do is, you know, add that package, uh, D2 logger, and there is a one-time initialization that you need to do, where you'll say, this is my DHIS endpoint, this is my username and password, this is the organization unit where I want my logs to be registered, what is the program ID, and what are the data uh, program, the IDs of the data elements for message and message type. And then what we're going to do is just use the logger and you can have a success, error, warn, debug message, etc. So I'm just going to run this code now. And you see the logger was initialized. We sent the events and the logger is finished. So I will just uh, refresh this page. And you can see that, yeah. So, so easily we were able to use, uh, you know, basically use DHIS as a logging mechanism. Uh, but this is a very simple use case, right? We are just logging the message and message type. But a lot of times we have to log more than that. Um, you might, you want to send like who sent the message or what is the module that is sending the message or the severity or there, were, there may be many more things. So that was our second use case or our second release. So in that case, what we're doing is we have created a tracker program. In the tracker program, your uh, log will be one program program stage and you can dynamically select what are the uh, data elements or what are the messages you want to send well, what are the type of contents you want to log so this is an example of an advanced logger so you create a tracker program same thing uh, you give the dhis endpoint the username password you also give the tracker program id and uh, there should be a data element which say for message type you send that and then what you do is when you are sending a message, you can say, what is the tracked entity ID, program stage and enrollment ID that you want to send this message to. And then you can also configure like, okay, I have a data element called message in that I want to send this content. I have something called logged by and I'm going to send the user here and the module. Uh, and then let's run this. Uh, so yeah, the logger is initialized and we've sent events. So if you go to tracker capture, um, I have an advanced logger and you see here that we have just sent messages to tracker capture. There's a success log. And all. So uh, the advantage of this tracker uh, program, music, the tracker program is you can dynamically, you can keep adding how many ever columns you want as per your requirement. Um, yeah, so. That's it from my end. Back to Nacho, and we would appreciate any feedback or questions that you have. Thank you, Sneha. Um, thank you. So now I guess that if you have any question about it. Thank you, Nacho and Sneha. Uh, any, any questions initially for the ICT team? So your main use case is for DHS2 app to log inside DHS2, or is it like to for external system to log inside DHS2? And if it's the second one, then do you have other uh, language supported like Python or uh, mm -hmm. any other so uh, it can be uh, used? Over. Thank you. So this is actually both because it's a TypeScript library. You can use it in any TypeScript application. So um, you can do from outside and you can do in the same DHS2, but you are, you are always tracking towards uh, DHS2. So that's your destiny. And at this moment, it's only a TypeScript uh, library. We didn't port it to anything, any other technology, but it could be a good idea for the future. 
but these are not these are not good running shoes. Uh, hi, my name is Edson, and uh, I don't know that uh, is it clear for me, but I would like to know that is it possible to to know the user that uh, is performing some activities. Uh, for example, I want to know, I, I, I don't just know what the activity is happening. I want to know where, uh, who, who's done that thing. Thanks. So, thank you. So I guess that's the, the goal. The goal is to, as I was, I, when I was mentioning crash lyrics and analytics, uh, the intention was exactly that. Like you have some activity on the client side that you need to track and you are using the EHS tool to track that activity and to, to have some further information of what are the statistics around your application. So yeah, that's the that's a little bit the goal. And obviously I'm saying this and then I would need to look back to the GDPR and see what they say um, because you know they can be tricky depending on the type of uh, information that you are tracking. But yeah, uh, honestly, the, the goal would be that one. I have a quick question just to follow up on that as well. Um, it's right now, I believe it's just a message, a single string message, yeah. right? Um, but one of the powers of DHS2 and maybe also of, of a lot of these, these analytics platforms is to be able to do structured logging and do basically different types of analytics based on yeah. the, 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 yeah, you might have a number as, as that you want to track everything with number two in this field or something like yeah. that. That's a bad example. But uh, is that something that you've thought about or, or it might be on the roadmap? Definitely it's in the roadmap. And we want to that, at this stage, we didn't have that need for the immediate uh, application that we needed to implement. But yeah, for the mid-run, I don't say even the long run, the mid-run, uh, we are thinking of that. Yeah. And uh, I might be wrong, but uh, I think we can already do that if you use the version 2, which is tracker program, where you can dynamically set what kind of uh, messages you want to uh, send. So say you want to... Uh, send a number, you create your tracker program with a data element called whatever you want. And then uh, if you use that, you just have to configure, uh, I mean, your log message can be configured to have dynamic values, not just message, but not just a text message, but an ID, a number, etc. So you can do that. Awesome. I was, I was the plant question in that, in that example. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um... Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Carlos. Uh, I would like to know if it's possible to also track server logs uh, at the back end for this. Uh, for, for, for example, if I'm running analytics mm -hmm. and I got an error, uh, usually what I do is go to the server, try to see what happened, but in, in the back end, right? It's possible to have this information without needing to to, to go to the back end. Thank you. Yeah, totally. And actually that's the that's the beauty of making it available for the community. As long as you are using a TypeScript script, you can do it at this moment because it's only importing it and then you decide on the TypeScript script which type of information you want to log. So you can, obviously, you can program that to get some server information and put it inside the DHS2 very easily. Uh, we can use uh, that module uh, to track uh, different programs at the same module. Yeah, and uh, here I will pass to Sneha because I I think the answer is yes, but um, she will have all the details. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't understand the question. If so if you, you could... can track in multiple programs, I think that was it, right? Yeah, yeah. So you just, you can uh, track in multiple programs, multiple instances. You just have to configure it that way. If you want to track to multiple pro programs, you initialize multiple programs. So you'll have logger one, logger two, logger one. So you can have like, um, server one logger, server two logger, and you can log accordingly. No, in in different ones, you can. You remember the initialization of the logger? 
So actually you could have multiple variables, one initializing one program and another one initializing a different one. And then you call the logger that you want to use whenever you need to use it in the code. So yeah, it could be. There was one question online and then, then we'll probably have to wrap up. Which one is it, sorry? Make an exception for you. Uh, very innovative. Is there a specific reason not to use a major open source monitoring solution like Grafana and or Kibana? Yeah, uh, that's so. The the question is why not using Grafana? So why not using something that exists already? Um, well, the reason is that sometimes you have a user that is already having a user in DHS two. You don't need to teach that user how to move into a third technology, into Grafana or any anything else. Obviously, Grafana, many other solutions that exist right now, they are very good on with having that information. And even like we could create a logger that is logging into something else. But the, um, the motivation here was to use DHS2 because what's the platform of the users? And and so, yeah, uh, well, I'm talking to you, but actually I'm talking to somebody that is here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's the, I don't know who is asking David. So. Question. Yeah, uh, I was going to say that I think it's really nice that or cool that you use DHS2 concepts for something like this, mm -hmm. uh, because then you have it in core and you like this is something we've discussed in the core team. Like we need we want something to monitor and also maybe in the future like send back to us core from implementations. But there's of course a lot of complications with privacy and all this yeah. stuff. But my main question is. So you show this setup and configuration. Have you thought about like automatically doing this setup? Because you do have a dependency on setting up these programs and stuff, yeah. right? So if you were to use this in an app, you would first figure out like maybe the root level of the organization unit you want to log for and what the user has access to and like the program you have set up and like have a thought about how you would do this easily for developers, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think definitely it should be possible. I don't know. Actually, we have, as you saw, we have a script running in the background that is already used in the library, and we have also an application. In that application, for example, the the um, uh, credentials, you don't need to put them in the initialization because it's already provided. So why not? Um, I don't know the details, and probably I don't know if Sneha knows the details of, of that, but I don't know how he selected the organization unit in that particular use case. But it would be great to have a default behavior for all the parameters. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And if we don't have, maybe we, Sneha, we can know that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, a that's a re really great idea. And that was what we initially started with. But yeah, creating the program on the fly was, uh, I mean, based, uh, it's in our goals, but we've not yet done it so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, great idea. Thank you. Thank you very much, ITT team. Thank you. Thank you, Sneha. So you should see, hopefully, Technical difficulties. There we go. OK, so for those of you who are here at the very beginning of the session, um, we're going to do a little bit of an interactive bit for this last 15 minutes or so that we have, 10 to 15. And uh, so if you can log into menti.com and use the code that's there, um, we'll have a series of questions. Uh, but also, I encourage you to think about any sort of discussion topics, maybe, or, or topics that you'd like to to dive into a little bit about extensibility um, that we could yeah that we could spend a little bit of time on today uh, or follow up with later so if you're not there already feel free to join the this mentee um, want to know who you are first of all um, hopefully if you are in the wrong auditorium you figured that out by now because we're 
about an hour into the session. Uh, but if if not, the other uh, auditoriums are around. The, that was that was the fourth uh, answer that we were joking about. Uh, if somebody was here by mistake, um, but hopefully we'll have some people who are building DHS two extensions. So mostly developers uh, or people that are in organizations that are building these these uh, uh, extensions. Some people are kind of managing and and uh, a DHS2 instance and the different apps or things that they're using to extend the functionality. And some people are just using something that has an extension to DHS2, whether that's a plugin on a dashboard, whether that's a, an application in DHS2. So probably everybody should be on this third one, just a, a hint. There's no, there's no wrong answers, but I imagine most people have used a DHS2 extension at some point in their life. So that's the first question. The second question, a little bit more, oh, sorry, this is not the question. <laughs> this just wanted to tease some other sessions that we have this week. Um, so Gashetil and myself will be at the AIML session Wednesday at 1030, which is a form of extending DHS2 because it's not built into DHS2 core itself. Uh, we have the app competition, which we announced this morning. Uh, you saw the finalists uh, present their videos. The voting is open now online, so you can go online and, and discuss those or, or see those videos. Um, and several of the other uh, people who submitted uh, applications to the app competition this year as well also posted on the COP, so you can find, uh, find those apps on there as well and discuss them. Um, and we also have a developer meetup. So this is Today, we're, uh, th that last session was a little bit more into the code, but we're not focusing on the technical part of how you build an extension here today or how you uh, develop on DHS2 as a platform. That will be Thursday at 10.30. Um, so feel, feel free to join that as well if you're in that first category of people who build extensions. Okay, the first question is, what does extensibility mean to you? And it can mean a lot of things to different people. Um, this is an interesting question because uh, people have different ideas of what, what, it, what it actually means. So I'm curious to see what, uh, what we get here. But for you, what, what, is, what does it mean when I say extensibility or extending DHS2? What does that mean? Flexibility or flexible? It's a good response. I hope we get more than one response. There we go. The ability to increase something's scope, that's great. So DHS2 has a certain scope and there are some things that are outside of that initial scope. Extending it means expanding that scope. Adding scalability, uh, sustainability, they're sustainable. Optional, so it's something that isn't, isn't there by default. Uh, plugins, uh, but yeah, very good example. I mean, we use plugins in a very specific way, but plugins are just a term for plugging one thing into another thing. Um, going beyond what's built in there by default, going the extra mile, adding some functionalities, using it for more sectors, more domains, uh, go out outside the box of DHIS2, complementing with other systems, uh, uh, applying creativity to uh, adapt the core offering to different problems, making communication with other platforms easier. Lots of good examples here. Um, but you can see that this is something that a lot of a lot of people have different answers too. So I think it's interesting to see uh, what, what people think of when they hear the word extensibility. And now let's talk about what you use or what you build today. So there are different types of extensions within DHIS2, and maybe the most common that everybody thinks of is an app, but that's just one of many ways that you can extend the functionality of DHIS2. We saw several examples here today that we're using server-side scripts or server-side services. Uh, in addition to apps. Um, so what do you use um, here today? Uh, so some people didn't answer the first question, so they're in the yellow. Uh, <laughs> but this is also kind of segmented by what you answered your first question. So if you build DHS2 extensions, if you install and manage DHS2 extensions, or if you use DHS2 extensions, I think it's an interesting uh, breakdown of these answers as well. Looks like we have a lot of people using apps, many people using scripts, custom forms, obviously something that has been around for a long time that people use to extend the functionality of DHS2. Uh, dashboard plugins, I'm betting it was Eirik, who is maybe here, who did the capture plugins, because I don't know if there's many other people who are using that yet. <laughs> huh? Oh, okay. Who, who's, who's the second one using capture plugins? I want to know. No? 
Maybe they lied. It's okay. <laughs> there, it's, it's aspirational. They they want to use this new functionality. So that's that's new in version forty one. So uh, probably not too many people are using. It. Yeah, yeah. I mean, playing around with it. There's a lot of great. Yeah. I mean, you can use it now. So it's it's very new. Impressive. Um, yeah, custom backend services is another one. SQL views and server side integrations. Um, lots of lots of good examples here. So now a lot of those different types of extensions are made possible by features of DHS2 as a core platform. So we build features to make DHS2 extensible, including things like being able to install new applications, being able to add a plugin to the capture app or to the dashboard, being able to create a custom SQL view or use custom forms, those types of things. So there's a lot of things that are already supported, but there's a lot more that we could do as well. So if you were to choose, what new extensibility feature or features would you like to see added that aren't there today that would make your jobs easier or that would make make it easier to extend that functionality? Custom API endpoints is a good one. We have the routes API, which was introduced in version 40 that does, it's not exactly custom API endpoints, but it lets you add an API endpoint to DHS2, which points to a backend service that you, you build and maintain. So that does allow you to extend the capabilities of the DHS2 API. Server-side custom apps, this one uh, I would love to see as well. Um, mobile data collection, form builder, that's a good one. SQL views, we, we have uh, support for custom SQL views, but I think it could be expanded, definitely. Uh, custom workflows, lots of good examples here. Public visualizations, public dashboards is one that comes a lot. Um, we'll hear more about AI uh, integration um, on on Wednesday, but there's a, there's also a lot of work ongoing with uh, how to integrate um, different types of advanced analytics with DHS2. Embedding custom scripts, lots of things like this. Um, integrating ChatGPT. There's a few people who've played around with this, including Eric as well. Um, not not ChatGPT specifically, but uh, was it was it OpenAI? No. Yeah, yeah, you could choose different ones. Um, okay, great, great examples. And now we use a lot of these uh, extensibility features as well on our core development cycle. So we build DHS2 applications and we release them on the App Hub and you can install them. So I wanna know, have you actually installed a new version of an application to your DHS2 instance? They come, they come installed out of the box. Uh, there's, no, there's no wrong answer here. Um, but you have to go in and manually go to the app management app and say, I want the next version of the data visualizer app, or I want the next version of the capture app, for example. Um, and you can install that. Uh, so I want to know who, who's used that, fe that functionality within the, for, for core applications. I'm glad somebody asked what is continuous release. I won't call you out because I can explain what that means. Basically, it means that we release new versions of applications that don't need to be, you don't need to upgrade your entire DHS2 instance in order to get that latest version of that just that one app. This makes it easier for uh, you as a, a DHS2 instance administrator to upgrade just a part of your system uh, in a way that's quite safe. So you can up, update that one application like the data visualizer application. And if something breaks, or if you don't like some functionality there, or you need to address some bug, or you need to train your users and they, they, they're confused, you can roll it back to the version before. And you can go back to the, to the version just for that data visualizer application. It doesn't make any changes to the database. So it's quite a, an easy thing to, to move but, uh, and to update. And it also allows you to get the latest bug fixes within a week or a month and not a year, which is what it would take to wait for the next uh, major release. Obviously, there are patch releases as well, but those also take some time. So it looks like some people have used it, some people have not. I encourage you to look at the applications that are available on the App Hub for uh, updates to the core applications as well as custom apps. And I think this is the last one, but how do you learn about, find, and install custom extensions? So where do you go if you want to extend the functionality of DHS2? One of these options is you build it yourself. There are lots of other people that are out there that are building these types of applications. We saw a few of them today. We saw some of them this morning in the app competition. Um, so do you go to the app hub? Do you go to the community of practice? Do you ask people? Uh, word of mouth, do you just sort of hear about something that somebody built and then ask them to send it to you by email? 
uh, there's lots of different ways that you could find uh, and discover these types of things. So this is very helpful for us also as we're continuing to evolve and, and, and improve the ecosystem of extensibility within DHS2 to understand how you find how you find these things, how you want to find these things, and how we can improve the, the, the app hub, for example, or the ability to share things on the community of practice and find them there. Okay, well, sorry, this is the last one. What is your biggest extensibility challenge? So we are, we are running just up to the end of time, so we'll uh, have break in just a minute, but I'll leave this one up here so you can continue to add uh, extensibility challenges here, and maybe we can address some of them. But just to wrap that up uh, for the, this session for today, I wanna thank the presenters again. We had three great presentations that were submitted as abstracts. Um, so round of applause for our three presenters. And for those of you who are online, that was applause for you, <laughs> uh, for you who presented online as well. Um, and just want to open it up to anybody who wants to ask questions. You are uh, free to go in, in 30 seconds for, for the break. But if you have any questions for me, for any of the presenters who are here, um, I'm going to be here for another few minutes. And feel free to share your, your extensibility challenges, and we'll work on addressing those in the next year. So thank you all very much for being here. And feel free to come up and ask any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.